let's assume someone hears this and they say, okay, so it turns out that um, antidepressants are really no more than the placebo effect, there's no big deal, but they seem to be okay, I, you know, I might as well stay in them anyways because maybe they know better than a placebo, but what's the, so what's the big deal if you stay in antidepressants for four or five years? Like, what's the big deal? Sure, you know, it's, I mean, we, we, it's an active placebo, right? And we know placebos work, so let, let's give it to them as an active placebo except for the health risks and the side effects. Do you know what the rate of sexual dysfunction is on SSRIs? 75 to 90 percent. I've seen two different estimates. Uh, the most recent one was over 90 uh, percent. The one before that was 75 percent. Sometimes it uh, goes away after five weeks of discontinuation. Sometimes it does not. That's just one of the uh, side effects. Health risks for children and young adults can include the increase in the risk of suicidal behavior. In the elderly, there's an increased risk of stroke. There's an uh, uh, increased risk of death from all causes in the elderly with uh, antidepressant uh, use. There's an increased risk for everybody of type 2 diabetes. There's an increased risk of, of uh, relapse, which we've talked about. And then there's withdrawal syndrome. And what you need to know, it's not just the person taking the antidepressant that might experience the withdrawal syndrome. If that person happens to be a pregnant woman, especially in the latter stages of pregnancy, there's a 30% chance that her child will be born addicted to the SSRIs. Mm -hmm. That child will show, show what's called a neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's the same syndrome that is shown by the children, the babies, the neonates of mothers who were on heroin, barbiturates, cocaine, well, and I see other side effects as well. Um, it's, it's well known and documented in the literature that all drugs have a very negative effect on um, the, um, the gut flora. And so as you take the drugs, you are not only decimating your gut flora and creating toxicity, but you're creating the leaky gut syndrome, which creates even more toxicity and more illness. The other side effect that I see is that when we shove our feelings aside, which is what an antidepressant does, it pushes the feelings aside, like the grief. They're not going through it. They're not releasing it. They're shoving it down. When we shove feelings down inside, uh, that in itself creates illness. A lot of illness is from people ignoring their feelings and not expressing them, not feeling them, not crying, not wailing, not not really releasing them out of the body. When you learn to move towards your feelings, to embrace them, and allow them to release out of your body, then they don't get stuck inside. Stuck feelings cause illness. And so, you know, as I said in my other talks, many of you know that 90% of illness is stress-related. Well, when you, you know, the antidepressant is supposed to t help take away the stress, but when you put a lid on feelings in any way, rather than a me you know, with a medication or because you're in your head and you're ignoring them, um, you create stress in the body, physical stress in the body. And that creates more illness. So for me, it's so important with the people I work with to uh, help them find a way to embrace and learn from their feelings and release them, rather than shove them aside with especially any form of medication. I'm curious, this is just a, actually maybe a piece of trivia, but I can't resist it now because you know when a chemical like serotonin, for it to work, for it to do what it's supposed to do, it binds to what's called a receptor. Do you know where most of the serotonin receptors are? The gut. They're not in the brain, they're in the gut. That's where the, the, the largest concentration of serotonin receptors are. So that sparked that. Yeah, and, and you know, so much of the research that's been going on is about the gut. 
and is about what we need to do to heal the gut because uh, like I was, I was talking with Brian Clement yesterday before he gave his talk on autism, and there's so much research on the fact that it's the um, it's the problems in the gut that are creating uh, the tendency towards autism. And then if the child um, lacks uh, a good balance in their gut, and then they get vaccinations on top of it, that can trigger. And that's why some kids get it and some don't from the vaccinations because. Some kids have healthy guts, and some kids don't. And um, I don't know if many of you know, but when a child is born, um, they don't have any any um, bioflora in, in their gut. And so the first dose they get is um, in the birth canal. But if they're born in C-section, they don't get any. And the second is in nursing. But if they're not nursed, if they're not breastfed, they don't get any. And so, so many babies are born C-section, or they're not nursed, and or they're not nursed, or if their mothers are not healthy, then they're not getting healthy flora. And so these babies come in without healthy flora, and then, you know, they're getting ear infections, then they're getting antibiotics, and then um, they get a vaccination, and bam, they go into autism. But it's not the vaccination itself. It's that they're already sick. And they may be sick because their parents are taking medication like antidepressants and other medication that has destroyed their gut flora. And then it's being passed on. And so from my point of view, um, I mean, unless it's, it's a life-threatening situation, I, I personally, I don't take medication. And so unless it's a life-threatening situation, I'm gonna find some other way of dealing with something other than medication. And I just have to make it clear that I'm not against medication in general. And I do take medications. I'm against medications that are ineffective and carry risks without the benefit. Right. You always have to look at the risk-benefit ratio. And apropos of, Mar of what you were saying, Margaret, one of the other risks of antidepressants, of SSRIs in particular, is that it increases the risk of autism when taken by a pregnant woman. It also increases the risk of physical def deformities in the baby, and that's even if it's taken in the first trimester, when often the woman might not even know before the woman even knows that she is pregnant. The audience here today knows very well that when they go in the supermarket, it doesn't matter which one of the sugary cereals are on the aisle, they probably don't trust any of them. They go in the candy aisle, it doesn't really matter the brand, they don't trust any of them. They go in the soda aisle, the chips aisle, they don't trust any of them. But when it comes to prescription drugs, they trust very much. They believe, and so I do, that doctors are incredibly smart people and we believe they're very honest and we have very good feelings. And they prescribe not only antidepressants, but a whole bunch of other ones. Now, is this an isolated thing, the placebo effect with antidepressants, or could anything be extrapolated from this to say that if the number one or two biggest drug in the world, antidepressants, turns out to be similar to a placebo, does that mean anything about all these other ones that we're trusting very comfortably that the doctor is an expert in and it must be effective, or is it possible that other drugs also are like this? There are some other drugs that have large placebo effects. There are many drugs that do not show large placebo effects. So you can't overgeneralize. We know that antibiotics can help heal infections. Placebos do not. Placebos do not have an effect on blood sugar uh, uh, levels. They don't heal fractured bones. They have a tremendous effect in mood disorders including depression and anxiety. They have a fairly substantial effect on pain, about half the effect of a pain reliever is a placebo effect. And that is true for aspirin, and it's true for non-steroidal steroidal anti-inflammatories, and it's true for morphine. And you might say, well, how can that be? I mean, morphine's more effective than ibuprofen. So 
if morphine is twice as effective as a, as a placebo, the placebo must be more than half as effective as the ibuprofen. Is that making sense? And here's the key. There isn't one placebo effect. There are many placebo effects. And how strong the placebo effect depends on how strong you think the drug is that you're taking. So placebo morphine is more effective than placebo ibuprofen <laughs> by a fair degree. But I think you're also asking, Stephen, about um, drugs like statin drugs for cholesterol and things like that. And I think there's a lot of research out. I don't have this, you know, the research on, at, at my fingertips, but I do a lot of reading. And um, I see that there's a lot of research out about what these drugs actually do and how harmful so many of them are on many, many levels. So I want to suggest that nobody just accept what their doctor says. Just because this doctor is trained in what they do doesn't mean that they're trained in, in preventative health in any way, doesn't mean that they're trained in understanding. They're, they're treating the symptom. They're not treating the underlying problem. And fortunately, there's some functional. Fortunately, there's a functional medicine doctors that are that are getting the training that they need to deal with the underlying problem. So that they they don't just give a drug for symptoms, which ultimately can harm the person, but they're dealing with the, the you know what's really going on within the body. <laughs>